I'm Jack O'Keefe. And about 20 years ago, I ran residential retreats for people with depression, diagnosed clinical depression. And I did it holistically under the supervision of a psychotherapist and um, a psychiatrist. And what we found was that depression was fundamentally an overuse of the self-referencing network. Self-referencing network is a series of neural pathways in our brain. And it is where we get the sense of me, myself, I. And when me, myself, I, through some type of trauma, maybe environment, maybe toxins, maybe food, maybe genetic, when some, something is out of balance, and caused the self-referencing network to be the main way that we perceive life, then we move towards an experience of depression. That's how the imbalance shows up. Now, what the self-referencing network does is it makes things about me. Healthy use of the self-referencing network is, oh, it's, 3.20 in the afternoon, and I promised to meet a friend at five. Okay, there's me looking at the clock, taking responsibility for where I have to show up, and it's gone. Now, overuse of the self-referencing network would make drama about me on the same perception. There's the clock. I don't have much time. I'm under pressure. I want or don't want to meet this person. What if I forget about the time? What if, I, what if, what if, what if? And worry comes in, which is a me story, always a me story, it's all about me. What if they cancel? What if we have an argument? What if they don't like me? What should I wear? How do I look? What will we talk about? And so the more, our self-referencing network becomes the dominant way that we think and our attention goes on it too much. Everything becomes about us, everything, much more than what's needed for participation in life. But we tend to listen to what's going on to our head and tune out what's actually going on around us. Because the self-referencing network, all it needs is attention. And if we give it a lot of attention, it becomes a cyclical relationship. And the me stories become, mm, the me stories involve your emotional capacity and the emotional capacity will always take more attention. If you have a thought with an emotion, your attention is going to be there. And so when the me stories get emotional and, and run away with themselves, then everything is about me. What do they think of me? I'm making a post on Facebook. What do they think of me? What's said? How am I looking now? And so our neediness gets over-exaggerated because the self-referencing network gets amped up. When it's all about me, we're depressed, we're depressed. Because the all about me gives rise over active mind and emotional body. And we feel like crap because we're out of balance because of our brain, the way we're paying attention to what our brain is doing, how it perceives the world is being reflected what does that have to do with me? How does that impact me? Everything becomes about me. That will trigger emotional content. You will hit overload, overwhelm, and the emotions will come too much. Hopeless, helpless, inertia, lack of motivation, dopamine switches off, 
survival mode kicks on. And so it's about I'm not safe. And so there's fear. And it, it, it's a bit of an avalanche. It's a rolling snowball, picking up more and more self-referencing emotional content. And this is what gives rise to depression. This is what we found gave rise to depression. When we ran residential courses, um, I certainly did it for two years, maybe two and a half years. We put people on a detox diet. We found that unless somebody was off medication for six weeks, they hadn't a clue what I was talking about. When my approach included, can you see what your mind is doing? Can you see the self-referencing network? Can you perceive that your mind is making a me story around about what's happening? If somebody wasn't off medication for six weeks, they couldn't see it. The capacity to, to observe benignly the thinking mechanism that was the problem, the self-referencing network, when they stepped back from the self-referencing network, there was no clarity. That position couldn't be, oh my God, I think like that all the time. That kind of clarity of noticing your thinking, I've never known somebody who was on medication within a six week spell to actually have that capacity to see thoughts objectively. And so they worked with a psychiatrist. My patients worked with a psychiatrist to, uh, to slowly get weaned off meds over a six week period. That's what we did at the time. It worked. We put people on a vegan diet. We did a serious detox and gave them acupuncture daily but they were held. I had a staff of two people holding each one, energetically holding each one, being there, watching, caring. Day and night, two people taking care of each one person. The course was not commercially viable, but we did it out of love and, uh, and a desire to find out what's the relationship between how we use our mind and what's diagnosed as clinical depression. Because I felt in my gut, if we can exercise our capacity to be aware of where we put our attention and of different viewing points, if we can encourage shifts in perception maybe we will starve the self-referencing network of new material and it will revert to a healthier usage. It worked. What we found were commonalities in each person with diagnosed depression were the following. A belief that I am not safe. I'm not safe in the world. The second one was one-to-one -one relationships are tricky. Either I don't have the capacity to trust people one-to-one -one, or I always find myself in friendships with people who treat me badly, betray me, use me. Somewhere the one-to-one -one relationships were always tricky. Invariably, there was um, developmental trauma around uh, bonding with the primary carer and separating in a healthy way from the primary carer. This was always um, an issue that we had to heal. And so establishing like an autonomous sense of self and from there learning about boundaries, learning um, uh, social skills, what are my personal needs, how do I balance my needs with my friends' needs. And so we went into um, learning tools and skills 
so that intimate relationships could be cultivated and practiced. The third piece was around anger. Anger was inverted. Invariably, there was a block around expressing anger, feeling anger, acknowledging anger. Underneath anger, we always found desires or needs in, our, in the childhood that were not met. And so when we found the anger, it's like, well, what do you need? that nobody nobody's asking you what you need or nobody's giving you what you need if they are asking you what is it that you need and it's it it was interesting that the unmet needs of the child now being verbalized now being understood that's what i needed can i give it to myself now where can i get it now or do i need to speak to a to somebody who was in my family at the time and and resolve it that way. Sometimes that's what happened, but rarely so. We can usually do these things for ourselves. Underneath the anger, inability to express anger was an inability to express needs. And as a result, needs were not met. So when our needs are not met in our childhood, our own needs are usually not met as an adult because we didn't learn how to, oh, my needs, I can acknowledge them, feel them, and they get resolved. So we were about putting that in place. R tune in, what do you need? Can you give that to yourself? Can you make that happen? Sometimes you will and sometimes you won't. But knowing what they are was a huge part of it. If we didn't get that piece of dialing in to remember what your needs are and in present day being able to voice what your needs are invariably it would light the short fuse of anger and the anger always would be inverted bottled inside and so rumination is what would happen with that heat that's generated from anger instead of it being expressed released held loved, resolved, expressed in a healthy way. There's many ways of resolving anger, of letting it rise up and come out. But when it's been accumulated and inverted, turned in on yourself, then we found that it gave this overlay of emotional content that sealed depression into the body. When, when the levels of um, inward focused anger were quite high, that person would always tell me, it's in my body. I, I feel like the depression is in my body. When I would ask, where is it? Is it in your head? Is it in your body? Is it like all around you? If it's in a place, where is it? And invariably, those who said it's in my body we would find that anger was the primary place we had to work. When you've got, from, from a, um, an energetic point of view, it's base chakra, second chakra, th solar plexus. It's beliefs from a belief point of view and a, a behavioral point of view. I am not safe. The world isn't safe. I'm not comfortable in intimate relationships and I find them really hard and I don't know how to do them. And I'm angry. Mm, I don't get my needs met and, and I'm angry at myself. I swallow my anger. When those three things were in place, invariably the heart center was locked down. The heart protector kicked in. And opening the heart was something that we worked on every day. How to open the heart. We did it through chanting. We did it through meditation, teaching people how to meditate. We did it through connecting with nature. Copious examples that always led to a felt sense of love for who you are now as a person. 
So breaking those self-referencing habits of blaming yourself, of feeling you're worthless, looking at self-worth and self-value and turning it around to like, oh my goodness, it's what happened to you. It's not who you are. It's what happened to you is creating the self-referencing network. Dial in to the purity of your own spirit. The true, the true beingness of what you really are, of what you know you started off with. That's who you really are. And dialing in to that personhood. That's not a me, myself, I. That's an inner felt sense of softness, deliciousness, and showing people how they can trust their own inner beingness, introducing them to self-love, to where they, they begin to value themselves. This is the work that we did to open the heart. And as self-love was cultivated, we were then equipped with a set of keys to impact on the sense of self-worth, on prioritizing our own needs as adults now, and of trusting ourselves in relationship, following our intuition around whom whom to let in and whom to walk from. No longer needing to be loved everywhere, not projecting our needs, but standing in our own autonomy. And okay, what are my needs around friendships here, around one-to-one -one relationships, platonic or sexual, it doesn't matter. It's one-to-one -one in any shape or form. And am I safe in the world? And if you love yourself, you will automatically feel safe in the world. It's part of the package. When you rest in your heart center, that felt sense, you can only rest there if you know you're safe. Knowing that you're safe, feeling that you're safe. These are the two pieces that guide you into the heart. You can know that you're safe intellectually, but if you don't feel safe, your heart cannot open. You won't find that love center. You won't be able to melt into your true nature. You won't. Are you safe right now? Like right now, are you safe? Can you let yourself feel that you are safe if the answer is yes? Can you let yourself feel that you are safe. Let yourself experience safety. Now you're set up to go into the heart center, to go into that felt sense of love, love that cannot be earned. It's unconditional love. It's love that's there for you always. The self-referencing network will think that you have to earn it, that you must deserve it, that it comes through others telling you that you're okay. That's a, an overused self-referencing network running amok. Ignore it, ignore it, observe your thoughts. It's just my thinking. In your heart center, go into that felt sense, live from there. You might be able to do this for 15 seconds in one go, and then you're back into your mind, thought, content. It's not about how long you can stay in the felt center of your heart. It's about how often you go there. Because neural pathways, if you can break the continuity of your attention, you break their potency to stay active to stay repeating the same narrative. It does break. That yakety yak of negative self-talk breaks. Your attention is the key. Put your attention into your heart. Heal the sense 
of I am not safe, the world is not safe. Heal it, dissolve it. It's a belief and it's not true. Almost always, it's not true. Trust yourself in relationship. Use your intuition. Don't project your needs into your friendships and relationships. You can manage your needs and your relationships will be cleaner, easier. You can bring your heart instead of the broken neediness to a friendship. And your own sense of self-worth, honoring whatever emotion comes up. Allow anger to be expressed. Don't vest your emotions. Let them come, be expressed. And if you need to like, I need to leave the room to let go of this anger, then do. The car is a great place to scream. So whatever the emotion is, acknowledge it, release it. Don't swallow it and come back to your center. An emotion is in motion all the time. Don't lock it up. It'll make you ill. Let the emotion pass through. It's like, what's the emotion? There it is. Even in naming an emotion, it's now moving because you are watching it from a distance rather than being swallowed up in the experience of it in an echo chamber within your own body. By naming an emotion, ah, I remember telling somebody, do a Google search and find all a, a list of emotions. Just gather them on a, an A4 page, stick them on the refrigerator. So that like, what am I feeling? What am I feeling? So that you can train your mind to objectively identify a feeling inside your body. That's really useful because it matures your emotional capacity, your emotional body. It matures it to where... I'm the manager of it. I have emotions. I can name them and I can let them go. And you will let them go. And you'll have loads of them in a day. And they're not a problem because they don't knock you off center. They don't swallow you up. They're recognized and it's like they pass through on the side. That's what it's like. There are the major findings that I found over those years of working with people diagnosed with clinical depression. I hope it's of use. Thank you for watching.